does masturbation promote any kind of muscle growth at all? Or is the most anti-prolific anabolic androgenic steroid of the bunch? Does it even lower serum estradiol levels or simply prevent estrogens from working on a cellular level? With less than 100 studies performed on Drostan alone, close to a third of which aren't even available as a full publication, those questions might be hard to answer. But let's do our best trying to interpret what little scientific evidence we have to see if Drostan alone is worthy of injections or not. Vigorous Steve here. After reviewing all of the available publications on Drostan alone, I've come to the conclusion that Masterone and the other branded Drostan alone propionate products were actually rushed medications for the treatments of various breast cancers, and a large portion of the studies in the clinical trials were actually funded by the original developer and manufacturer, Syntex Pharmaceuticals. Safety is rarely reported, and if it is, it's merely a small footnote somewhere in the study because they're mostly looking at breast cancer remission rates during drosanolone propionate treatments. Drosanolone propionate was only investigated and prescribed as a growth inhibitor of breast cancers, and keep in mind that cancers are some of the most prolific cells of the body, so if drosanolone or some of its metabolites actually reduce cancer growth and allow cancers to go into remission at clinical dosages between 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams weekly, then what kind of effect does it have on skeletal muscle when dosages are far, far greater than that? From a medical perspective, drostanolone is anti-prolific, anti-growth, or at least in the context of breast cancers. But when it comes to skeletal muscle, the scientific evidence is paper, paper, thin. Still, there might be some overlap, so keep that in mind going forward. Before we get into the scientific evidence, I just wanted to mention, I looked everywhere, ev literally everywhere, for the medical insert of Mastrone or Masteril or Drolbun or any kind of FDA-approved drostanolone propionate product. Couldn't find it anywhere. So, if you happen to have it, any kind of medical insert revolving around drosanol propionate, let me know, email it over. I would love to share it with you guys so everybody has insights. It doesn't matter if it's French or German or English, the language is irrelevant. I'll get it translated, but I'm not able to find it myself. So if you do happen to have it, let me know. I'll make a separate video and link it down below. From all of the scientific evidence that I was able to find, it appears that drostanolone hasn't really been studied in the context of liver toxicity or kidney toxicity or neurotoxicity for that matter. And since we do understand and know that drostanolone has an anti-estrogenic effect by potentially lowering serum estradiol levels by inhibiting the aromatase enzymes or blocking the effects from estrogens at the receptor site, reducing or preventing estrogen-mediated gene transcription. And we also know that it's the estrogens that are hepatoprotective and nephroprotective and neuroprotective and also protective for the cardiovascular system. Um, the safety data is lacking to say the least. And there's also no data on potential for heart enlargement. So what are we to do, right? Can we say that drostanolone is super safe? No, not entirely. The safety data simply isn't there. And maybe all of this has been extensively documented in the older studies, which I simply can't find the full publication of. I couldn't find anything concrete in the Handbook of Experimental Pharmacology, volume 43, written by Charles D. Kokakian, or any of the older steroid books, which document and index uh, scientific evidence from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. I found all of the old Herzberger bioassays assessing the myotropic to androgenic disassociation. I'll put those ratings on the screen, even though we already kind of debunked that in the uh, debunking the anabolic to androgenic rating video. I'll link it at the end of this one. Um, I found some additional data going through the um, Herzberger bioassays. You can see here that the anabolic rating compared to testosterone, right, is a little bit lower or a little bit higher, and the androgenic rating is significantly lower. But when compared to methyl testosterone, you see that drosanolone is almost four times more anabolic with a little bit less androgenicity. And while we all would love to believe that the androgenicity of a steroid represents virilization, the growth of facial hair or body hair, hair loss from the scalp, deepening of the voice, acne potential, blood pressure changes, or mood disturbances. Again, the anabolic or the myotropic rating and the androgenicity of particular steroids have only been assessed on the liver, ani muscle and the ventral prostate of animals. It has nothing to do with other tissues of the body. So if you hear a guy say that drostanolone is hair safe 
because the androgenic rating is a little bit lower than testosterone, and there's no clear scientific evidence that drostanolone propionates, enitate, or heptanoates, or drostanolone itself when administered orally can cause hair loss in the limited, very limited scientific evidence that we can review. It doesn't mean that it's hair safe. Really guys, do yourself a favor, just unsubscribe from these guys, don't follow their advice. Absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Go with what the community has always told you, that draw standalone, mastrone, and anything of the kind causes hair loss at higher dosages and the longer you use it. So if you care about your hair, avoid mastrone. And with that out of the way, let's have a look at the previously approved medical applications, which were in effect until trostanolone propionate got discontinued from clinical use in, let's say, the late 1980s to the late 1990s, depending on the country. Um, and that's perhaps due to the introduction of aromatized inhibitors or selective estrogen receptor modulators, or due to illicit use by the enhanced fitness community. And since I couldn't find the medical insert anywhere, these treatments are stemming from a multitude of different sources. That being said, drostanolone propionate, masteral, masteral, drolbon were only prescribed in the treatment of advanced and inoperable breast cancer in women, whether those are postmenopausal or not, sometimes in combination with tamoxifen, couldn't find the dosages anywhere. The dosages based on the clinical trial are between 100 milligrams intramuscular once to three times weekly. Based on the Anabolics 11th edition uh, written by William Levelin, that's 100 milligrams intramuscular three times weekly, so that's similar to the clinical trials. Or 200 milligrams intramuscular two times weekly stemming from Wikipedia. Yes, that's the source of information too, uh, which I couldn't find a confirmation of in any of the studies that I was able to find. So let's say that's a dose between 100 milligrams to 400 milligrams total weekly through intramuscular administrations. But let's go with clinical trials and the scientific evidence that's between 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams weekly, sometimes in combination with tamoxifen. And with the limited scientific evidence that we have, and again, guys, I did my fair share of research on this one. Here are the evidence-based unique characteristics of drostanolone. It appears that drostanolone might prevent hepatic breakdown of testosterone by inhibiting the steroid 5-beta reductase enzymes, which means impaired testosterone, but also glucocorticoid metabolism. Did anybody ever notice that serum testosterone levels go up after adding in the mastrone? If that's with an, a non-sensitive test that might be mastrone detecting <laughs> as testosterone, but if you have access to liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry testing, please do a test. Let's see if this plays out in the real world before you add in the drostanolone propionate enitate or heptanoate, if you can source that, before you add in the drostanolone, get a baseline testosterone reading, see where you're at, and then four weeks, six weeks into your cycle, adding in drostanolone on top of your testosterone base, you're not allowed to add in HCG, DHEA, or increase your testosterone dose. Let's see if serum testosterone levels went up. I would love to see it, um, but unfortunately, I don't have high sensitivity testing here in Thailand. So it's up to you to get the before and after data if you're interested. Um, based on all the clinical trials and scientific evidence, obviously, drostanolone has various anti-cancer and anti-tumor properties. It inhibits glycine uptake into fibroadenomas in animal models, which has an anti-prolific effect in cancer cells. Does that mean it also inhibits glycine uptake into skeletal muscle where you need glycine for collagen synthesis? Uh, those studies still need to be performed. Androstanolone has carcinolytic effects by increasing messenger RNA and DNA ratio in R3230S carcinoma cells stemming from an animal model. Um, it's probably a Star Wars robot that it has carcinolytic effects in. And basically, long story short, drostanolone is destructive to cancer cells. And apparently, drostanolone doesn't improve symptoms of anemia, even at dosages between 200 milligrams up to 400 milligrams daily. Yes, that's right. That's between 1400 milligrams up to 2800 milligrams weekly. But this is only in the context of aplastic anemia and renal failure. Now, don't worry, we'll get to the high dose studies a little bit later on for the guys that are interested in megadosing masterone. And it might sound appealing that hematocrit and red blood cell count doesn't really budge when you take this much masterone. But aplastic anemia patients are generally responsive to methanolone enithate, primabolin, or oxymetolone anadrol treatments, in which case complete blood count parameters, hematocrit, red blood cell count, hemoglobin concentration, 
all improve. So why doesn't it happen with drosanolone propionate treatment? We do know that increased red blood cell count and hematocrit is considered to be an anabolic effect, right? Anabolism in the bone marrow increases red blood cell count and hematocrit levels. So if drosanolone propionate does not potentiate this effect in aplastic anemia patients, but methylone enethate or oxymethylone do potentiate this effect, then is drosanolone propionate anabolic at all, right? That remains to be debated. The scientific evidence in this context is incredibly thin, but I would like to see an increase in red blood cell count before I consider an anabolic androgenic steroid to be actually anabolic. Drosanolone decreases prolactin levels in animal models, and they might even lower total cholesterol levels in patients with hypercholesterolemia. Do you see this play out in the real world? Probably not, right? Prolactin levels coming down due to its anti-estrogenic effects. Sure, I see it on blood work all the time, but total cholesterol levels coming down after adding in drosanolone propionate, enetate, or heptanoate for that matter. Um, no, no. Usually low density lipoprotein levels go up after increasing your anabolic androgenic steroids intake. So you still need ancillaries and over-the-counter supplements to keep your total cholesterol levels and your lipid parameters under control. I don't use scientific evidence to um, exclude the azetamibe and the citrus bergamot from your stack. Drosanolone enethate, fermentation with fungi, produces nine anti-cancer metabolites, uh, none of which I was able to find in the scientific literature in the doping cases that humans produce these metabolites. And in the same study, they found that fermentation of drosanolone enethate produced two cytotoxic metabolites. We'll get into that a little bit later on. And drosanolone potentially reduces estrogen binding potential to estrogen receptors in human breast tissue, determined in in vitro models, not with biopsy. So this has potential selective estrogen receptor modulating like effects. The scientific evidence, incredibly thin on this subject, but we can use a couple studies performed on dihydrotestosterone to kind of explain this effect. We'll get into that a little bit later. Let's briefly go over the anti-cancer and cytotoxic studies, which I just mentioned, because it's very interesting even though some of these metabolites might not be present within the human body following drosanolone administration. In this study performed by Chowd Hari et al. published on December 20th, 2017, titled Biocatalytic Structural Transformation of Anti-Cancer Steroid Drosanolone Enethate with uh, Fungi, right, unpronounceable names, and Cytotoxic Potential Evaluation of its Metabolized Against Certain Cancer Cell Lines. This study investigated the potential cytotoxic effects of drosanolone enethate metabolites. Cytotoxicity is the degree in which a substance can cause damage to a cell. Uh, keep in mind that these metabolites are formed through biotransformation of two different fungi. And again, I couldn't find any of these metabolites found in human studies, so I'm not entirely sure if they even form within the human body after drosanolone administration. While all nine metabolites shows various degrees of cytotoxicity against HeLa, PC3, H460, and HCT116 cancer cells, which again shows promise for the treatments of various kinds of cancers. And two metabolites were found to be cytotoxic against 3T3 normal cell lines, which are the fibroblast cells found in the connective tissue of mice. Just keep in mind that cytotoxicity doesn't automatically mean that a compound is carcinogenic, but all carcinogenic compounds are considered to be cytotoxic. And there's another study documenting the metabolites produced through biotransformation of drosanolone heptanoate using two other kinds of fungi, again, with unpronounceable names, but the researchers didn't really look into anti-cancer effects or any kinds of effects at all for that matter. Uh, two of these metabolites were previously detected in the urine of rabbits dosed with drosanolone orally, so maybe there's a little bit of hope that any of these metabolites can be produced within the human body. But so far, the scientific evidence is extremely lacking. Now, allow me to do some dubious extrapolation in an attempt to explain how drosanolone might interact with the estrogen receptors using scientific evidence based on dihydrotestosterone. Yes, and I'm very well aware that drosanolone isn't identical to dihydrotestosterone, but this is the best that we can do because again, the drosanolone studies are lacking. This study performed by Hung et al. published on October 1983, 40 years ago, 
titled The Evaluation of Androgen Antagonism of Estrogen Effect by Dihydrotestosterone. This study, they basically looked into the effects dihydrotestosterone has on estrogen-mediated growth of uterine tissue in female mice and how DHT might affect estrogen and progesterone receptor content and activity within uterine cells. And while dihydrotestosterone doesn't seem to reduce estrogen or progesterone receptors within the cytoplasm or the nucleus of these uterine cells, it does impair estrogen-mediated gene transcription and messenger RNA synthesis by reducing polymerase II activity. However, this study performed four years earlier, so that's 44 years ago, performed by Jung Testas et al., published on March 1st, 1973, titled Effects of Sex Steroids and Anti-Hormones on Growth, Adhesiveness and Receptors of L929 Cells Cultured in Serum-Containing and Serum-Free, media. This is an in vitro study where they assess the effects of dihydrotestosterone in estrogens on mouse L929 fibroblast cell lines. Might be a little bit different from the 3T3 fibroblast cell lines of mice, um, where they found that two of those fungi metabolites were cytotoxic. Androstenolone, uh, better known as DHC, reduced estradiol to estrogen receptor binding sites uh, Dihydrotestosterone reduces estrogen receptor content within the cytoplasm of the mouse uh, L929 fibroblast cell lines, but protein synthesis and cell proliferation was not affected. So depending on the study you read, dihydrotestosterone might have a weak inhibiting effect of the estrogen receptor, even though when you look up the relative binding affinity of androstenolone DHT for the estrogen receptors, it's less than 0.1 compared to estradiol. So what's going on here? Uh, it might reduce estrogen receptor content of the cells, prevent translocation into the nucleus, impair estrogen-mediated gene transcription, and reduce messenger RNA synthesis. And again, this is all coming from animal models or in vitro studies, studies which are very old, published over 40 years ago. They haven't really been duplicated since. They've been performed on dihydrotestosterone, not drostanolone itself. Again, I wish it was, but that isn't the case. These studies have not been performed on other DHT derivatives, but we can still take a little bit of the scientific evidence, do some dubious extrapolation and understand how drostanolone could potentially work by interacting or downregulating or preventing the functioning of the estrogen receptors, right? And these effects might also play out for methanolone or mesterolone, primobolin or provirin, which are also known to have anti-estrogenic properties. And as for the aromatized enzyme inhibiting potential that drostanolone might have, I couldn't find any scientific evidence to support it, even though we clearly see this on blood work before and after of various enhanced fitness enthusiasts after they add in the drostanolone to their PED stack. I ran all of the metabolites which I could find, right, whether those are fungi produced or metabolites found in the doping studies through a search regarding aromatized enzyme inhibition, couldn't find anything, probably because it hasn't been investigated. So even though the scientific evidence, again, is lacking in this aspect, we do see in a real world practical application that drostanolone lowers serum estradiol levels in some people, not in all people. Maybe that's because their drostanolone propionate is actually testosterone propionate. So you can't really compare that and give that a fair assessment. But I do know from people who have tested their drostanolone products through third-party testing that serum estradiol levels take a slow but steady reduction. And again, based on the chemical structure and all of the scientific evidence that shows and proves that dihydrotestosterone inhibits the aromatized enzymes in various organs and tissues, I would say that it's extremely likely and plausible that drostanolone, methanolone, or mesterolone, or some of its metabolites potentiate and offer similar effects. Again, scientific evidence is lacking, but maybe one day or another, this will be proven and hopefully I'll be alive to see that happen. Okay, let's move over to the clinical trials and see what we can learn from those. Again, not all trials are available as a full publication, so I wasn't able to include those results. It's only been investigated on drostenolone propionate, the branded Mastrone, Masteril, or Drolbon. Drostenolone enethate or heptanoate has not been investigated in clinical trials. 
The subjects were all elderly postmenopausal adult women. The total sample size amongst all clinical trials, again, from the ones that I was able to find, is 278 adult women. Investigated diseases only advanced inoperable breast cancer. Treatment dosages range between 100 milligrams intramuscularly once to three times weekly for total dose between 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams per week. Treatment duration was anywhere between 10 weeks up to two years and 10 weeks, but it highly depends on cancer remission in the subjects. And the drosanolone propionate treatment outcome ranged between 17% up to 41% cancer remission, albeit that some patients still experienced cancer progression during the clinical trials. And these cancer remission rates are actually very similar to methanolone enitate or fluoxymestrolone, but that's usually combined with tamoxifen. So that it seems that there's no additional benefit, again, regarding cancer remission rates, choosing drosanolone propionate over the other anabolic energetic steroids investigated in the context of breast cancers. In some of the clinical trials, they co-administered either 600 milligrams cyclophosphamide intravenously twice per week, or tamoxifen, Nolvidex, albeit that I don't know the dosages because on those clinical trials, only the abstracts are available. And the complications amongst all clinical trials are either nausea, virilization. Keep in mind that in many of the Syntex Pharmaceuticals funded studies, clinical trials, they specifically mention that no virilization occurs throughout the duration of the clinical trial at various intervals. Jaundice might occur, hypercalcemia, which is the case for most anabolic energetic steroids when investigated for diseases, increased libido, increased hematocrit and hemoglobin concentration by about 5%, like I mentioned earlier, irregular menstrual cycles, increased blood pressure, and weight gain. Now, you would consider that the increase in hematocrit and weight gain is an anabolic effect, but it will go a little bit more in depth a little bit later on. Based on the clinical trials, it appears that drostanolone is generally well tolerated and that the side effects are minimal, but these are always cliff notes. And when you read the finer print, you see that most of these clinical trials were either funded by Syntex Pharmaceuticals, or at least they provided the Masterone or the Masteril for the research in these studies. I am of the firm belief that many of these clinical trials were rushed through and show a bias for a positive outcome so Syntex Pharmaceuticals could get some return of investment because methastrone, now known as Superdrol, was never FDA approved or used in clinical settings and oxymetalone anadrol, which was approved for the treatment of anemia. So you have two out of three medications which were developed and investigated by Syntex. They got approved for clinical usage for one medical treatment in particular. So one of the biggest questions surrounding your standalone is, is it even anabolic? at all. Some people absolutely swear by drostanolone. They run it year round at very high dosages and say that it's mad anabolic and they get a boatload of strength and additional growth out of it. While other bodybuilders or fitness enthusiasts only use drostanolone during a contest prep or cutting phase to complement the cosmetic appearance that they get from the other anabolic androgenic steroids as part of their stack because they feel that Mastrone simply enhances their appearance, but doesn't build any additional muscle tissue alongside the other steroids, which are parts of the PED stack. So what does the scientific evidence say about anabolism? Starting with this study performed by D. Pietro et al, published on March, April, 1963, titled Treatment of Advanced Breast Cancer with 2-alpha-methyl-dihydrotestosterone propionates, better known as drostanolone propionates. In this intelligent study, which I translated with chat GPT, so bear with me, guys, a 20 female patients with advanced breast cancer received 100 milligrams drostanolone propionate three times weekly, so that's 300 milligrams per week, for two to eight months. Six out of 20 patients went into cancer remission, but five out of 20 patients, the cancer actually progressed and worsened. The researchers noted that only one patient experienced virilization, but the other patients did not. And thus, the researchers claimed that drosanolone propionate is practically free of virilization. Finer print, Syntex Pharmaceuticals provided the Mastrone. I mean, don't you love the 1960s where everything is safe and efficacious, including uh, cigarettes and asbestos? Uh, the researchers also note that there's a notable anabolic effect in about 50% of the patients due to weight gain observed within the first two weeks of treatment, after which um, it remained relatively stable. So in those first two weeks, there was an average weight gain of approximately 2.8 kilograms amongst the 10 patients who experienced weight gain. Um, but honestly, that sounds like water retention to me. Even though Mastrone is not really known to potentiate water retention, at a dose of 300 milligrams weekly, you would expect 
progressive weight gain like you see in all of the other anabolic androgenic steroid studies where weight gain is assessed. Moving over to another study performed by Helmut et al. published on August 26, 1972, titled Hormone Therapy of Breast Cancer with Special Reference to Masteral Therapy, also funded by Syntex Pharmaceuticals. In this study, 20 menopausal women with breast cancer received 100 to 300 milligrams of standalone propionate weekly, resulting in an overall remission rate of 32%. Nearly all patients experienced virilization after six weeks of 300 milligrams drosanolone propionate weekly, while 32% of the patients treated with 100 milligrams drosanolone propionate weekly also experienced virilization. However, this percentage increased to 50% after three months on 100 milligrams weekly. So the longer you use it, the more likely it is to experience virilization if you're a woman. I mean, if you're a woman, I would stay clear of Zorsanol propionate or most DHT derivatives, unless it's oxandrolone, but I already made a video about it. I'll link it down below. Uh, the researchers also noted that patients experienced weight gain, which was considered an improvement of the general condition. So besides these two human studies and some of the animal models, the other studies don't really keep track of weight gain during drosanolone propionate treatment. Now, we do know that drosanolone doesn't really have a dramatic effect on hematocrit or red blood cell count, hemoglobin concentration, or other complete blood count parameters. We also know that drosanolone propionate is considered an anti-prolific drug, again, in the context of breast cancers. So it appears that 300 milligrams drosanolone propionate weekly does not have a dramatic anabolic effect based on the scientific literature, right? Does weight gain go up in humans and animal models? Yes, is it dramatic? Far from it. I think 300 milligrams testosterone, any ester, would result in more of a weight gain that is going to be linear. And it's also going to increase hematocrit, red blood cell count, and overall complete blood count parameters, um, which has been proven in many a scientific publication. And well, we also know that oxymetolone is very good for weight gain and to improve overall complete blood count parameters. Um, so if you want to use something from Syntex Pharmaceuticals that's still FDA approved, go with oxymetolone, right? But we'll make a separate deep dive video about oxymetolone and Adrol soon. Let's move over to the high dose studies because nobody gets out of bed for 300 milligrams drosanolone propionate. And if it's not really anabolic at that dose, maybe a higher dose will get us an anabolic response. This study performed by Choi et al. published on September 1974 titled Hypertriglyceridemia in Hemodialysis Patients During Oral Dromostanolone Therapy for Anemia. Drosanolone has many a name, but I went through all of the synonyms for this video. In the study, five uh, female and 12 male patients on hemodialysis due to kidney failure received between 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams of drosanolone orally. So that's not propionate, anatate, or heptanoate. That's raw drosanolone orally four times daily. So that's a total weekly dose between 1400 milligrams to 2800 milligrams for at least six months in duration. So that's not exactly injectable drosanolone propionate, but there's only two high dose studies out there, and both of them use oral drosanolone, and these are the only studies that actually go beyond 300 milligrams weekly. So it's either 300 milligrams weekly or 1400 to 2800 milligrams weekly. Five uh, patients had to discontinue the treatment due to significant side effects within the first one to three months. Two patients had to reduce the dosage and were able to continue the treatment for 10 months in total. Complete blood count parameters did not improve in any of the patients. The researchers reported no adverse effects on the examined liver parameters. Patients with chronic active hepatitis did not observe a worsening of their condition. So at least this is a little bit promising. If liver parameters were assessed and uh, already pre-existing hepatitis was uh, not worsened with this much oral drosanolone, then maybe it's not hepatotoxic at all. Reported side effects include increased appetite, stomach pain, weight gain, without mentioning how much weight was gained or if weight gained stalled after a certain amount of weeks on the treatment. And just like the high dose primobolin study, some patients reported muscle cramps during the treatment with drosanolone orally. Moving over to another study performed by Azen et al. published in August 1977. Man, so many old studies, but that is all that we have access to. Anagen dependency in acquired aplastic anemia. In these two case reports, a seven-year-old girl and an 11-year-old girl, both with severe anemia, received, just like the previous study, 400 milligrams rosanolone orally 
per day for a total of 2,800 milligrams per week for a three to four months of treatment. Unfortunately, the red blood cell count failed to improve, so these two young girls were treated with oxymetolone instead, after which hemoglobin concentration rapidly improved. This study didn't keep track of other blood work changes, body weight gain, or reported any adverse effects. So we don't know if these two young girls experienced any muscle or weight gain or any short-term or long-term virilization during drostanolone or oxymetolone treatment, um, right? So we don't really know what's going on here. But still, this shows that oxymetolone regarding the improvement of complete blood count is far superior than drostanolone when taken orally. Um, and we might be able to extrapolate from that that there's minimal, at these high dosages, <laughs> minimal anabolic effects regarding red blood cell count, right? It hasn't been investigated in skeletal muscle. We don't keep track of body weight gain, but since the increase in hemoglobin, red blood cell count, and overall complete blood count parameters are considered an anabolic effect of anabolic androgenic steroids, if that does not occur, but it does occur with another steroid, um, well, what are we to assess from that? And well, all we have to do is look into our own community for guys that are trying to reinvent the wheel. We have the nandrolone only cycle. We have guys in Europe doing boldenone as the replacement for testosterone based. No testosterone in the picture. They would use a similar dose as boldenone. This has been done in Europe for many, many years. There's guys that like trestolone as their foundation. There's guys that run testosterone like I do as their foundation, but there's no mastrone only cycle out there. So let's do this fun thought experiment. You have one gram of anabolic androgenic steroids to play with per week. Everything is equal. The training is equal. The nutrition is equal. The supplements and the ancillaries is equal. One gram of mastrone versus one gram of anything else. Testosterone, primabolone, trestolone, nandrolone, trenbolone. Um, which cycle of uh, one compound is going to give you more gains? Masterone or any of these other ones? You tell me. <laughs> Let me know in the comment section what do you think is a good idea. I would go with a grammar test. Test is always best. And talking about not having much scientific evidence to work with, the same goes for the detection time. All I was able to find is a single study where they administered 25 milligrams of channel propionate orally, so that's not entirely the injectable route, whether it's intramuscular or subcutaneous. The long-lasting metabolites of drosanolone propionate were detectable for up to 30 days. And regarding the half-life, Anabolics 11th editions uh, mentioned that the half-life of drosanolone propionate is approximately two days. I could not find any clear scientific indication what the half-life of drosanolone propionate is, but again, a good amount of the studies are simply not available as a full publication, so maybe it's hidden somewhere in the archives. Um, so the half-life we're going to base on testosterone propionate or testosterone inotate, and the half-lives are on the screen, right? This is based on scientific evidence. Drostanolone propionate, um, if all things would be similar regarding metabolism, then the half-life would be between 0.8 to 4.5 days, and with drosanolone inotate, that would be 4.5 to 10.5 days. So if you want to beat the drug test, I would just stick to the reported detection times, which have always worked for myself and all of my athletes. With drosanolone propionate through intramuscular administration, that's up to two months. And with drosanolone inotate intramuscular administration, that's up to five months. And that brings us to the dosing protocol for men running drosanolone propionate or inotate. I would say that the sustainable and tolerable dose, totally based on the Syntex Pharmaceuticals funded clinical trials, is between 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams intramuscularly or subcutaneous weekly. Split it up any way you like until blood work parameters become unmanageable. And the deleterious dose would be anywhere over 300 milligrams per week. So let's say 300 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams drostanolone propionate or inotate weekly for a maximum of 26 weeks, purely based on all of the blood work results that I've seen of guys running drostanolone for such a long period of time. It seems that drostanolone, just like primabolin, the blood work parameters are pretty manageable if you know your ancillaries and your over-the-counter supplements and you eat healthy. Uh, but if your blood work parameters turn, uh, take a turn for the worst, discontinue it, go back to a cruise, clean out, go back to testosterone replacement therapy, and uh, then assess your health parameters a couple months down the line to see if you qualify for another masterone cycle or not. 
For women, the sustainable and tolerable dose is zero milligrams weekly because it clearly causes virilizing side effects. And the deleterious dose is basically from the clinical trials between 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams intramuscular or subcutaneous weekly, but only, only, only if you compete at the higher levels. And I would still favor Primabolin over Mastron because the cosmetic appearance is um, very, very similar at these dosage ranges. Um, you would probably get a better result regarding anabolism at a lower dose for, for primabolin with less virilizing side effects. Um, but if you want to combine both, right, discuss that with your coach because there's, there's something to win, then, well, anything goes, right? And honestly, just to keep it simple, I would pair your drostenolone dose to the dose of testosterone that you're running right now. If you're running a gram of test, a gram of mastrone is acceptable. But if you're also running a gram of primabolin, then you probably need a far lower dose of drosanol propionate or enetate to get the cosmetic effects out of it. I don't consider drosanol to be an anabolic agent. I consider it a cosmic enhancing drug that enhances the drugs that you're already taking. So if you're taking a combination of test, primo, and trenbolone at a low dose, maybe complement that stack with a low dose drostanolone, right? A combination of tren and drostanolone at the same dose, let's say 350 milligrams tren and 350 milligrams drostanolone on top of a testosterone base goes a very, very long way. Now, nowadays we like to keep our trembolone dosages far, far lower, unless you do a bodybuilding competition where the dosages might be a little bit higher, again, because you want to win. So if you go with 70 milligrams uh, trembolone, um, 70 milligrams of standalone seems to be favorable for cosmetic enhancing purposes, right? There's a boatload of different combinations you can follow. Ultimately, it highly depends on you and what results you get out of your standalone. If you like it, you like it. And if you purely use it for cosmetic enhancing benefits, then only run it the last six weeks of your contest prep because if it doesn't potentiate anabolism, uh, why not run Prima Pollen? instead. And that being said, if you want to ramp up the dosages of your standalone to let's say 700 milligrams to 1000 milligrams weekly, 100% of the time, it will make you flat, regardless of how much growth hormone or oxymethylone you run on alongside your high dose draw standalone protocol. You'll be peeing up a storm every single night. We're talking about five to seven times going to the bathroom when you should be sleeping. Uh, maybe this is the reason why you're not anabolic. Food for thought here, man. If you're pissing up the entire night, I had multiple times to the bathroom, and you're not being very anabolic recovering while you sleep, right? Because you're in the bathroom, not in bed, laying down, producing more proteins for anabolism. Um, is it because it has an, a suppressive effect on aromatase enzyme inhibition, albeit that there's no clear scientific evidence to support that? We can clearly see it on blood work parameters of so many people in the, in the enhanced bodybuilding community? Is it by inhibiting estrogen-mediated gene transcription or its overall anti-prolific effects? That remains to be debated. But if you like Mastrone, let us know down below. Tell us your story of how Mastrone improved your quality of life and how fantastic this compound is. Personally, I would only use it at lower dosages alongside my testosterone and primabolin, which potentiate a good amount of anabolism. And the Mastrone would be there for cosmetic effects. And let's leave it here. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Vigorous crew, you guys know what to do. A no draw standalone front wall bicep for you guys. But I'm not entirely against adding in a little bit of draw standalone propionate or anything to my next cycle, uh, which I'm not entirely sure when that's going to be. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.